Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Let's talk about your health. No, really, let's let's talk about your health. Everyone should be well aware by now that the Biden administration is ramping up efforts to have people come door to door uh, in our neighborhoods to Uh, encourage getting the vaccine for COVID. Now, when I first saw this uh, story, I took some comfort in knowing that uh, this was just an idea floated by the president that had not been voted on or uh, financed by the federal government, so it would probably never get anywhere. Uh, More recently, I discovered that this is actually in a previous COVID law that was passed, in fact, and that it is real and it's already been going on. And there has been pushback, but so far the president's team in pushing back against the pushback has uh, suggested that there's nothing to be afraid of because the people that are coming door to door are not federal employees. Hmm. That makes it so much better. (laughs) Here's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. I remember, oh, I don't know how long ago it was, but not that long ago. In fact, I've had enough health uh, issues over the last several years that I've been to the doctor enough times that I know that part of the process is Uh, the requirement of everyone to ask me if I would like a copy of the HIPAA rules and that I have to sign this uh, little thing to say, no, I don't need another copy of the HIPAA rules. Everybody knows the HIPAA rules. The HIPAA rules are abundantly clear. The law is such now that no one is supposed to talk about uh, our health conditions uh, against our will, that our health information is private. Hmm. Whatever happened to that? Where have all the HIPAAs gone? All of a sudden, we have COVID-19, and not only do uh, I no longer have to sign that sheet, but now apparently people who are not even federal employees, who are not Uh, medical professionals are going to be given the information about whether or not I've had the vaccine. Uh, You know, it's getting harder and harder to not embrace conspiracy theories. Because here's what this sounds like. You know, I I don't envision... uh, this turning into, you know, door by door forced vaccination. I, I, I don't think that's uh, coming anytime s- soon. Uh, I do think, however, that just like so much of what happened during the uh, shutdown uh, created by COVID, that what's really happening is it, it just seems like the government is sort of probing its own citizens to see how much we will put up with. I think it was Khrushchev who said that the strategy of the uh, Soviet Union was to push and to push and to push until the West pushed back and then to back off. And that's, again, what it seems like the federal government's doing, not to uh, its uh, international foes, but to us. I, it, it just boggles my mind that anyone would think this is a good idea. That anyone would 
even begin to imagine that this is a good idea, that we're going to separate the world into those who have had the vaccine and those who have not had the vaccine and those who have not had the vaccine are going to be so disdained, so looked down upon that we're going to get a visit from not the federal government, but someone representing them, someone encouraged by them to come to the door. And I'm presumably someone informed by the federal government about these things. Can you imagine what that conversation would be like? Knock, knock, knock. How can I help you? Oh, we're here as part of a community awareness program for... Co thank you. No, thank you. Well, we just wanted to let... No, thank you. Is there anybody out there? Here's another way of asking the question. Do you, do you really believe there's anyone out there that doesn't know how to get the vaccine? that doesn't know that they won't have to pay directly for the vaccine, that doesn't know where to get the vaccine. Are there people out there that are going to get the knock on the door and someone's going to say, you know, you can go down to your this place or that place and get the shot for free and, and you'll be all set. Oh, well, if I'd have known that, I'd have done it a long time ago. Who is that person? Or do you envision instead great debates on people's front porches? It's not been tested enough. Well, sure it has. Well, how could it have been tested enough when this thing didn't even exist a year and a half ago? Well, because they did this and they did that. But they laid down, they set aside all the uh, standards for testing so that they could rush this through. You know, I, I I actually saw a piece a few days ago uh, from some fact-checking organization, and the only fact uh, I came away with was that this, this was not a fact-checking organization I particularly trusted. But what they were doing, they were answering this question, uh, would it be a violation of laws, international laws passed after World War II in light of the medical experiments led by Joseph Mengele and others uh, to give people this vaccine that has not been tested. And the fact checkers came back and said, no, this would not be a violation of those laws, those international laws, uh, because the experiments had been done. Oh, really? It's funny. I don't remember reading about those. I don't remember reading about those at all. And and <laughs> how do I put this? Here's what I know. I know the danger posed to me and my family by COVID. I know, and the Delta variant, and I'm sure the Epsilon variant, and I'm sure what other variants come after that. I'm, I'm well aware of the risks. I'm also well aware that we don't know much of anything at all about the risks that come with the vaccines. Because one thing we do know is these kinds of things can take time to be revealed. I'm not willing to be a part of the experiment. I don't have to be a conspiracy theorist at all to say, weighing these odds, I choose no. It doesn't make me a bad citizen. It doesn't put blood on my hands. It makes me an informed citizen making the choice that I want to. I'm not here to fuss at anybody. Who's got the vaccine? If you want to take that chance, by all means, knock yourself out. I'm not opposed to you. I'm not thinking you're lesser. But I'm not. I'm just not, again, I'm not interested. I know people have real hardships, real heartaches. I know people, many, 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 many people have died from COVID. I'm not disputing any of that. What I'm saying is, in my circumstances, in my wife's circumstances, uh, 
in our son's circumstances, it's an easy decision for us to make. Now, here I am revealing it to you on this podcast. I'm setting aside HIPAA. I'm sharing voluntarily. But what I won't do is have the government insist that I tell them or let them know what I've done, haven't done, or why I've done it. Friends, I need you to understand something. What you let the government do in times of hardship, they will do from that point forward. When you look at the growth and the size and the scope of the government just since COVID, and by the way, across the aisle, you witness the in real time, the illustration of the truth, that, that ideological uh, counsel that says never let a good calamity go to waste. COVID has become the boogeyman for which the federal government and Dr. Fauci and the CDC has determined to be the hero to rescue us and President Biden and his uh, army of door knockers. They're coming to persuade us to lay down our liberties so that they can secure our security. But friends, you know the expression, Anyone who would give up freedom in order to gain security deserves neither. As for me and my house, we're not playing. We're not signing up. We're not participating. Again, I'm more than happy to be your friend if you take the other view on your own family. But you don't get to decide for my family. And neither does anyone in Washington, D.C. We come now in our ongoing series, The Bible in Five Minutes, to the book of Romans. And I think it would be quite appropriate for us to oh, simply play a laugh track for the next four hours and 45, four minutes and 45 seconds rather, uh, because it's such a ridiculous notion that we could give uh, any just summary of such a grand book in the space of five minutes. But we're going to try, and of course, it's probably going to be closer to six minutes anyway. But even so, uh, this is not a, a fair way to get much of a grasp of the book of Romans. Romans is uh, probably the closest thing we have inside our Bibles to a systematic theology. Systematic theology is that theology that seeks to answer the question uh, of what does the Bible say about all these different themes? Uh, what is man? Who is God? How do they relate uh, in a coherent, uh, uh, interconnected kind of way, taking into account all that the scripture teaches uh, all over it? And and we don't have that uh as our Bible, we instead have the Bible as the Bible, the way God decided to give it. But Romans is that place where we become, uh, we get closest to that. We begin uh, the Apostle Paul writing this church to the church at Rome. He'd not yet uh, been there, though uh, through his travels and the travels of others, he knew some of the people there. And he would certainly end up there later on in his life. But Paul is writing to the church uh, at Rome, and he starts off by discussing and demonstrating the reality of the universality of man's sinfulness. Uh, Romans 1 answers the, in a great and powerful way that question, well, what about the, 
the person who's never heard about Jesus? And the answer is everyone knows that there's a God. Everyone sees what God has revealed in the created order, and everyone by nature rejects that knowledge and so already stands guilty. So that when we look at God's interaction with us, we're looking at, apart from Jesus, the mass of humanity as rebellious, fallen creatures. Uh, Romans chapter 2 also highlights the reality of how our consciences condemn us. We're not only aware that God exists, we're aware of God's law, not the fullness of it, but that which is written on our hearts. We know that we violate it, and so we not only are all guilty, we all know that we're all guilty. From there, Paul moves into the best exposition uh, in the whole of the Bible on the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement of Christ, Jesus dying in our place, as well as, I would argue, the other half of double imputation, that not only do our sins become his and that he suffers for them, but that his righteousness becomes ours such that we will be uh, blessed and rewarded for them. And so Paul highlights for us, sort of unpacks for us two things. One, the, 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 symbolism and the typology of the sacrificial system in the Old Covenant and the meaning of the historical events of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, That's pretty important stuff, wouldn't you say? Uh, From there, uh, Paul goes on to address issues related to the sovereignty of God and related to uh, God's relationship to the Jewish people. Uh, and after that, in the last four chapters roughly uh, enjoin us to uh, lives of greater obedience and love and joy and all of that. Uh, I would say this at the end of the day, that if we, if we wanted to summarize this majestic book, uh, we would find that summary in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. My father has pointed out a number of times that The book of Romans has been instrumental in the shaping of the church, that those times and those places where it's been uh, delved into most fully have seen uh, the Spirit of God at work, that this is what... uh, awakened Martin Luther uh, at the uh, beginning of his new life in Jesus that led ultimately to the Reformation. Uh, It shaped the work of uh, Calvin and Knox and so many. Now, of course, we never want to denigrate any uh, part of Scripture in elevating some other part of Scripture. I don't want to be doing that here either. I do want us to know that this is a place where the message, I believe, the central message of the whole of the Bible for us is that we are sinners, that Jesus died for us, and that our Heavenly Father loves us, that that is just uh, shining in bold relief for us in the book of Romans. It deserves more than six minutes. It deserves a lifetime of study. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached through the book of Romans for years and years and years logic on fire. So please give it some time and attention and you will come to know the fullness of the grace of God more fully. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsportjr.com. And join us next time 
on Jesus Changes Everything.